yeah so we can begin whenever you are ready yeah so um good evening to everybody good evening sir good to see you sir yes yes um then yeah so uh, uh our pediatric hematology oncology team or the team at tata medical center we have been interested with the job of doing a teaching session on pediatric chronic myeloid leukemia and for that uh, we are fortunate to have professor deepak mishra uh, who is the director of our um, laboratory services and um, uh, my friend and colleague dr shekhar krishnan and uh, dr shravya chituri and dr deepankar de uh, who are our fellows and last time the least myself so uh, without further ado we'll start the way we have devised this particular uh, session is that we would have very short presentation didactic lectures to begin with initially me as a very short synopsis and then uh, professor mishra will uh, take you through the diagnosis and monitoring uh, which is very much uh, a, a very big part in the management of cml and then actually the, the biggest chunk that we have uh, is a case series of six cases which have got very specific points that we want to highlight and i would request the audience to keep the questions to themselves and keep the questions as case 1 case 2 and we'll try to address all the questions at the end of the session and uh, the uh, because the session is very tight in terms of the timing if i may start now Uh, i would say the chronic myeloid leukemia was possibly a disease of first particularly in the cancer world because uh, the leukemia itself they got the name uh, leukemia from a patient who possibly we think had chronic myeloid leukemia because the blood was looking so white and it took ultimately up till 1960s uh, when the so called philadelphia chromosome uh, was identified which gave the first inclination that a particular cytogenetic Uh, abnormality uh, or chromosomal abnormality could be directly linked to a cancer which was later found uh, or rather uh, found to be uh, translocation 922 and the reason why i have kept the photo of this particular lady uh, in the front just after um, the international women's day is that i have great respect for this lady because this is the same lady who um, Uh, said that philadelphia chromosome is not just uh, uh, 20tq minus rather it doesn't just uh, have got a shortened uh, long arm of q but it is translocation between the chromosome 9 and 20 this is the same lady who also told us that translocation 15 17 is the uh, sign qua non for uh, apml so this is janet rowley all the ladies in the audience particularly be aware of this lady and later uh, we found that the transcription 922 uh, was ultimately giving rise to transcripts called the bcr abl that we all know about and there have been lots of doins in this particular uh, arena who worked very hard one of them is uh, professor john uh, seeing him and uh, having been handed over some of his or uh, looking after some of his handed over patients at the fag end of his uh, career um and uh, it was only in the uh, in this new millennium that we moved uh, to the concept of tyrosine kinase inhibitor as the magic bullet which changed how we look at cancers today now uh, the pathogenesis will be uh, will be um, uh, discussed um, uh, by professor mishra but just wanted to uh, uh, demonstrate that the initially that chromosome 22 was uh, found that uh, in chromosome 22 when hungerford and noel they had uh, just using a normal microscope they had found that a part of the chromosome in this particular group of patients they had a shortened chromosome 22 and later we found that a part of the chromosome 9 came in there and uh, the uh, the part that came from chromosome 9 is the abelson gene which goes and sits next to what has been called the breakpoint cluster region so that's where the name comes from the bcr ab the breakpoint cluster region is because that's where most of the breakpoints seem to happen the reason why i have kept the slides is ultimately when they sit next to each other it gives the bcr abl uh, ultimately form the bcr abl transcripts 
Now the breakpoint cluster region, they uh, uh, initially it was believed that they have only five exons. And uh, so the names that had come from the transcripts that they ultimately produced. So you would, from the, in, uh, from the previous studies, you will find that they used to be called something like a B2, uh, A2, because the, the second exon from that uh, break, uh, BCR uh, region that was uh, uh, coming next to the A2 uh, region or the transcript that was formed by them. But now we have realized that it's not the five exons, but there are more exons. So the, the, new, the names have changed and it has become exon one, exon two. So now it is exon 13, 14. So just, uh, I wanted to take that confusion out because somewhere you would see B2, A2, and then it becomes E13 or E14 there. Now, if you look at the molecular pathogenesis, I would say that uh, Abelson uh, gene is what is responsible for or uh, in a very big way in terms of the proliferation adherence and apoptosis. It's like the good guy who sits there and does this. And the BCR part which comes in is almost like the naughty boy who, who uh, leads this, uh, the Abelson gene uh, waiver. So the regulators of the BCR, um, uh, takes away all the good functions of uh, the Abelson away and leads to very uncontrolled proliferation adherence and apoptosis. And that is the reason why we tend to see a lot of proliferation. But make no mistake, this even though the chronic minor leukemia that we know, all of us know as uh, pediatric uh, hematologists or pediatric oncologists, that it shows a lot of um, a lot of mature cells, but actually it's a stem cell disorder. Um, and it's not just a matter of proliferation, enhanced proliferation. It has got loads of other elements to it, which BCR, ABL possibly drives, including the inhibition of tumor suppressor, uh, resistance to apoptosis, um, enhanced self renewal. Now in the natural history of CML, it has always been uh, uh, described as uh, something that would have initially uh, re a relatively sedate phase where it is called chronic phase and then ultimately uh, gets some pace and becomes the accelerated phase and then uh, ultimately uh, leads on to the uh, blast crisis. Before the advent of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, normally a person would be there in the early chronic phase for approximately six to eight years. And then over six to nine months would uh, get into the accelerated phase and ultimately turn into blast crisis. Now here I want to introduce you to a concept called oncogenic addiction. Now we have all been taught that the cancer has got a two hit. So the two hit theory for the cancers. So the BCR ABL is possibly um, one of those uh, genetic hits where it does not need much else. Possibly it on its own uh, can lead on to the development of cancer, though there are various uh, opponents to this particular theory. Now, when they, it starts, it stays in this early chronic phase, or the, the, rather the early and the late chronic phase, the whole process seems to have an addiction or what is called an oncogenic addiction to only this BCR ABL. At some point, the, the leader of this gang changes and the process uh, moves away from the BCR ABL and because of genetic instability, once it reaches what is called an anaplastic threshold, moves into a very accelerated phase. And by the time they are in the blast crisis, possibly most of the effect on the BCR ABL is lost. Now, in terms of the uh, incidence, uh, this is UK incidence. Uh, it's definitely a, a disease of the uh, adults and it's seen more in the sixth and the seventh uh, decade of life. But we definitely have seen this at least a decade earlier, the peak uh, at least a decade earlier in our part of the world. And for the small children, definitely it's a disease of millionaires in a sense, it comes possibly once in a million. In terms of the presentations, we are all aware that uh, chronic myeloid leukemia presents primarily with the hepatosplenomegaly. Uh, it might also have other uh, uh, common features like not feeling too well, feeling tired, um, but generally that's the common presentation and could be very well be asymptomatic organomegaly that's picked up. 
the leukocytosis itself doesn't cause so much of a problem though uh, though occasionally it can lead on to visual problems it can cause priapism splenic infarcts but it's primarily the uh, the hepatosplenomegaly the with the blood picture that we see is generally a leukocytosis and here i would uh, want to give the concept of what is called middle bulge it's not only the middle aged men like us who have the middle bulge but here uh, if i say that uh, if you get a film of of a cml patient where it becomes very difficult to distinguish whether it's a peripheral blood or whether it's coming from a marrow where all the myeloid cells that you see in the in the marrow they have come out in the peripheral blood and it seems that the the middle cells the myelocytes and metamyelocytes they are possibly the most prominent uh, cells so which is called um, the middle bulge by most uh, hematopathologists um, there are other conditions which uh, it can uh, mimic like infection or the leukemia reaction it can be very difficult to distinguish but generally you do not get a middle bulge but uh, at the same time we might say that you can have just a chronic neutrophilia um, particularly in an adult where the, the first thought would be to rule out a cml uh, driving this and you would do a, a bcr abl or rather look for bcr abl, uh, ABL. similarly for a thrombocytosis which does it not getting better and it's uh, doesn't look re reactive again proving the point that this is possibly a, a stem cell disorder the other proof that this is a stem cell disorder is the fact that when it goes into blast crisis it can produce lymphoid blast crisis as well as myeloid blast crisis when we primarily are thinking that this is a myeloid disorder it's not and there is a concept called the hiatus leukemicus where even if you have an aml even though you can see the other mature cells the blast are the primary ones and you would not see the middle cells and you might have some mature cells so the middle bulge is something that i would like you to remember but professor mishra will teach us more now in the evolution of uh, therapy for cml originally the concept was it was a more of palliative sort of therapy uh, starting with the fowler sol solution with arsenic uh, splenic irradiation etc and ultimately it came to the control of the control of the disease so that it doesn't progress to the blast crisis or accelerated phase where the hydroxyurea came in and the stem cell transplantation possibly was the only way a curative option uh, in the 80s and the 90s of the, the of the 20th century and it took us till the the year 2000 or 2001 when fda approved imatinib so which gave us the concept of the magic bullets and uh, uh, in the therapy of uh, therapy of cancer or cml and uh, we have a lot more of this tyrosine kinase inhibitors with us now the survival curve though it's an old slide you can see how uh, uh, how big difference the tyrosine kinase inhibitors have done to the to the survival in the cmls when it was 5 uh, 6% before um, before uh, with busulfan even and now it imatinib it's exactly the opposite very um, short uh, treatise on on the tyrosine kinase inhibitors which are supposed to be the magic bullets is that we know that uh, the bcr abls they basically drive the tyrosine kinase here the atp almost sits or docks in a particular uh, part um, we, where it has to be in a particular conformational state which allows uh, the uh, phosphorylation of the substrate which has got lots of downstream um, uh players which ultimately lead on to the cml now either by um, occupying this uh, docking area uh, by a, a, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor you do not allow the atp to come and join there or change the conformation of that particular part which will not allow the atp to uh, get into the docking position is how the tyrosine kinase inhibitors there are various groups which are not get into but that's the basic mechanism by which we think the tyrosine kinase inhibitors work now the other question that we generally get asked is how uh, which tyrosine kinase inhibitors do we choose because we have got uh, quite a few now with us now if you believe the concept of the hair and the um, you know tortoise you would actually uh, it, it depends on what you want out of your treatment because that guides it 
because all, all the studies that have been done, doesn't matter what particular tyrosine kind is inhibitor used. Uh, if you look at the, uh, the long-term overall survival or progression free survival, they are all the same. It's that the, say, adacitinib or nilotinib, so they possibly give you a faster molecular remission to begin with, but ultimately at the end of it, the overall survival and progression uh, free survival are not any different. So does that mean that we do not use the other ones? No, because you might want to use that uh, the quicker molecular remission or the way to get a deep molecular remission to ultimately give a treatment free remission could be one of your aims so that you can allow possibly a young boy to, to uh, grow or a young uh, woman to uh, have a children without any drugs. But to do that, you have to plan early. You, you cannot uh, wait for years before you make that decision. So some of these de decisions need to come from all those discussions other than the fact that there can be mutations in there, which obviously will drive the uh, process and will direct how, what you want to do. The cost, the response, the toxicity profile, personal choices are the other factors. Now, uh, we have possibly the imatinib, dasatinib, and nilotinib uh, in our armamentarium. Ponatinib is something that um, are, is going through uh, trials. We do not have the same access. Bosotinib is still not uh, prescribed for children. Um, and a few years back, or even a couple of years back, we did not have access to dasatinib or nilotinib directly. But uh, recently, we have got that. But uh, getting these drugs into children can be quite difficult. Um, so there, uh, is, uh, there are ways of how to get them uh, uh, into children, uh, how to uh, disperse in water uh, or lemonade mostly. Uh, nilotinib can be slightly tricky because you have to use it twice a day. So these are the factors that you have to consider while we are trying to prescribe a particular drug. Now, tests for diagnosis and monitoring would be completely uh, Professor Mishra's uh, domain. So, uh, but uh, in very short, there would be tests to uh, diagnose the CML to give us the confirmation, the genetic confirmation, and there will be some other tests by which you either monitor the disease and the side effects, particularly the growth and development. The other question that comes is, do we have prognostic scoring system in pediatric CML particularly? Obviously that is very much uh, a big thing in the adults. Uh, but if you look at any of these scoring systems, you can make out that these are uh, literally statistical uh, gizmos, which have been uh, very useful for a for a particular trial for a particular uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitor. I think recently possibly the only uh, scoring system which might have some, uh, some uh, uh, usefulness in uh, pediatric CML is possibly the uh, UTOS long-term survival scoring system or the ELTS scoring system. Response assessment, which Dr. Mishra again will teach, is the, now we have gone to possible just looking at the BCR ABLs way more than the, any of the others. To remember that we will start off with possibly 100% disease burden. And we knew you just need to remember the, uh, the big point, time points, three months, six months, 12 months, 18 months. So at any of these time points, you want one log reduction or 10 times reduction. So if you started off with 100, then you want to come down to 10 by the time you are in, uh, in uh, three months, to come down to 1% uh, by six months, so on and so forth. And so, the, the, so basically the one and two are the log reductions that you are going to have. And depending on that, you give the names MR1, MR2, MR3, so on and so forth. By the time you have reached MR3, you have got a deep, uh, sorry, major molecular remission. And anything better than that is deep molecular remission, which is their ultimate aim. How does pediatric CML differ from adult CML? They present with higher white blood cell count. Uh, they uh, present in more advanced stages with, with large spleen sizes. Um, the BCR ABL breakpoints are, are, are different, which Dr. Uh, Mishra will teach us about. And uh, there are higher proportion of mutated cancer driver genes. So it's not exactly the same as that we see in adults. Earlier, HSCT was possibly the only way of curing disease. We do not do it as much, but does that mean it has completely gone out of, uh, gone out of uh, use in the TKI area, uh, era? Uh, if you look at the 1990s and the 2000s, lots of transplants used to happen. Now it has become much restricted. So possibly 10 to 15% of our patients who would be uh, raised and would need the transplant. And there has to be specific, uh, uh, um, uh, specific considerations while we're doing transplant. The CML transplants are not easy. The donor lymphocyte infusion is uh, definitely something that is particularly known to work in the uh, CMLs. 
Now with the last slide before I hand over this, uh, the, the slides to Professor Mishra, is that there are uh, challenges and unanswered questions in children because children, uh, we are not dealing with a 70 year old who has to live maybe another uh, 10, 20 years. Uh, children, they have got longer half-life. So obviously they come with their own challenges. They would have to live with the morbidities. They would have to live with this drug for as long as uh, we need to give them the treatment. Uh, stem cell transplant possibly still might have a bigger role in children in first CP than possibly in adults, which we might want to discuss later. And some of the TKIs have not been used in children as yet. Um, and the CML scoring system, though, the, as I said, the ELTS possibly has uh, some value, but possibly not for the others. And we do not have very good pediatric specific uh, treatment guidelines, though COG has come up with recommendation, BCSH had come up with some recommendations, but we do not have enough people because it's a rare disease. And we do not have definite treatment guidelines, mostly their recommendations and expert comments. With that, I'll stop and uh, ask uh, Professor Mishra to take over. Uh, very good evening to everybody here in the virtual audience. I can see that there are almost 56 people who have logged into this uh, program. And uh, I can see my good friend Swati Kanakya also is in the audience. So good evening to her as well. Uh, I know this is a, a PHO chapter uh, initiative to have such programs in different uh, parts of the country and I profusely thank uh, my colleague Nihar to have organized this and requested me to speak uh, in this forum. And in the next 15 minutes, my job is to discuss the diagnostics and the monitoring part of chronic myeloid leukemia in pediatric patients. So I will share my screen right now. Are you able to see? Uh, Neha, is my slide visible? Not yet, sir. Not yet, sir. Right now? Uh, no, sir. It's a blank screen. Okay. Let me uh, re... Now we can see it, but it's not the PowerPoint window. Not the PowerPoint. No, sir. It's uh, showing a Zoom launch. Yes, sir. Now we can see it. You can see? Yes, sir. Okay. And you can hear as well? Yes, sir. So, so the title of my talk is Chronic Myeloid Human Pediatrics, Diagnosis and Monitoring. Uh, before I proceed ahead, I must say that uh, the disease as it is, is no different than the adult population. The diagnostics and the monitoring essentially remain the same. Only thing the patient cohort is different. Pediatric hematologists deal with them. And whereas majority of the patients of chronic myeloid leukemias are dealt by the adult uh, hematologists. If you take the percentage of all CMLs, 3% of the CMLs are seen in the pediatric population. So it's not so uncommon, but it's not so common as you see it in the adults. Uh, I bring greetings from my hospital. Uh, you all know that Tara Medical Center is now uh, a fledgling center in the eastern part of India. Uh, no talk on chronic minor leukemia is complete without showing this slide. This is a seminal publication that appeared uh, in the journal Science way back in 1960, the year I was born actually. Uh, so the Philadelphia chromosome is the same as, as I am. And you see this such a small publication in a general like science revolutionized what uh, 
cancer is all about. So they found that this is a chromosomal abnormality and uh, the student and the teacher published this. Actually, the student found this abnormality and so did to his teacher. And together they then put it across and published this chronic granulocytic leukemia, a minor chromosome in humans. So since then we have gone a long way and uh, you know that conventional karyotyping is here to stay and that characterizes the balanced reciprocal translocation between chromosome 9 and 22 and this is the tiny little Philadelphia chromosome in chromosome number 22, the small one and a uh, lot of other techniques have evolved our, after you have, it is looking so simple here but the, because the technology has improved Otherwise, when conventional karyotyping started, the chromosomes were not so resolution-wise uh, uh, evolved. Now you can see that this dark and light band that's so precise and you have arranged it with, through a software and the cytogeneticists could analyze them very well in, in the stream. Previously, uh, if I remember correctly, way back in the uh, late 80s, we used to cut it and then paste it and then identification of chromosomes used to be a Herculean task until unless you are very trained in it. So now conventional karyotyping because of the availability of analysis, analytical platforms has become simpler, but uh, this is gradually getting replaced by DNA based techniques like uh, array based uh, technologies. But I must say that this is here to stay and is going to be there in the developing countries for quite some time because other technologies are pretty expensive to acquire and universalize. So this has been uh, complemented and supplemented by this. This is called fluorescence in situ hybridization. These are all interphase cells. This blue thing is the uh, seen through the aqua filter. So this is uh, the nuclei of the interface cell. And here you apply the probe. This is a dual color, dual fusion probe. And here you will find two signals. So there is a abnormal signal here. And this is a normal cell with two green and two red. Whereas there is a fusion signal here uh, in this abnormal cell. And there are a large number of probes available in commercially. And many centers they do different types of staining. This is a table which shows you how different types of staining can be there in fish: two red, two green, two uh, fusion, one red, one green. So the, like that, you can have various permutation and combinations when you apply different types of probe. Uh, this is a, a publication uh, in the Indian Journal of Pathology and Microbiology by my colleague. Uh, Dr. Mayur Parihar, when he was in Bellore, and this is a large publication, large number of cases, and this shows that how the fish patterns of BCA label fusion are seen in CMLs at diagnosis using different probes. So, if anybody is interested to look at this slide, you can refer to this publication of Mayur et al. So if you look in, uh, go into the, uh, the genomics part of this uh, balanced reciprocal translocation, Anyar has already dealt with it to some extent, but I will again uh, repeat it just for completion sake and to reiterate what is the importance of knowing about the exons and introns that are seen in chromosome 9 and 22. Here you can see that at the molecular level when you see the chromosome number 9q34 and chromosome 22q11 2 you can see that the abelson gene is found in chromosome number 9 uh, in this long arm and you can see that there are various exons which are numbered as 1a1 1a1 a2 a3 like that uh, and in chromosome number 22 also you have exons which are numbered from e1 to e19 and onwards. So why this is important is based on the break, the size of the product will depend. So based on the breakpoints, you will have either minor breakpoint, uh, minor BCR or major BCR or micro BCR. And the size of the product also will accordingly vary. 
and based on this also you will you will uh, devise the technique as to how you will be able to detect in a reverse transcriptase qualitative PCR in the lab these transcripts. So I will show you in a more uh, animated way as to how this translocation happens to give an understanding to the, between my clinical colleagues what exactly happens. So as we all know that majority of the transcripts are E13A2, E14A2 in chronic myeloid leukemia and to a very small extent you can find E1A2 also in CML but E1A2 is primarily seen in acute lymphoblastic leukemia. So if you look at this, this is how you will uh, analyze it. After you have seen that, you have the BCR and the EPL here, and uh, you, the, the, you design the primers based on this. And the primers will primarily detect these three transcripts. So it is a multiplex RT-PCR. In a single assay, you will see three bands. I'll come to that later in the next slide. So here what happens because of these different probes, the different probes will target the, the exonic regions and the fusions. And also it will, uh, on both sides, flank a little bit of intronic region also to cover a particular size of the transcript. So this is how it is. So you have the peripheral blood of the bone marrow, then you will remove the red cells by using the red cell lysis buffer. And then from the cell pellet, you will do the RNA extraction. From the RNA, you will convert this RNA to the complementary DNA. This is genomic RNA. So to that, you will convert it to complementary DNA. And then this becomes a starting point for the multiplex PCR by using set of primers. So there are three sets of primers that you are using and the directions are already mentioned. And this is going to detect E13A2, E14A2, and E1A2. And when you do the gel run to document the different bands, you will also put a molecular ladder. Then you will also put three different transcript standards. So these are all cell lines, K562, BV173, and SD1. They are the... Uh, uh, transcript the, the standard transcripts for E13A2, E14A2, and E1A2. And these are the patient samples, and based on the, uh, the band, you will uh, detect what type of transcript is present in the chronic myeloid leukemia. After all, it is chronic myeloid leukemia or not, it is based on the presence of these transcripts because this is one of the modalities of detection of. BCR able fusion transcript in addition to the conventional karyotyping and the, uh, the fish technique. This technique is simpler, the result is very quick. Even multiplex RT PCR, also the result is quite good, quick. You can give the result on the second day of sampling. Next, I will have an animated slide to show you exactly what happens. So what molecular abnormality is seen? This is the BCR in green and this is the in red. So as I move ahead, you can find that. Oh, sorry. You can see the slide now. Is the slide visible? Yes, sir. Yes. So so this is the BCR in the able. So the green side is the BCR and the red one is the able. And you can find that this is the exon 14. So this is where the breakpoint has happened. So the E14 will fuse with A2 to give the messenger RNA of E14A2, which is detectable. Similarly, if the break happens in exon 13, uh, you will find that uh, uh, the E13A2 will happen. You'll see it here right now. Previously, they used to be known as B3A2 and B2A2. So predominantly in BCRable, you find the P210 transcript. These are of two types, present in most patients with chronic minor leukemia.
So this is E1, A2, where exon 1 is fusing with the uh, able. And this is primarily seen in, a, in a adult as well as pediatric acute lymphoblastic leukemia, but also in some of the chronic myeloid leukemia. So P190 protein is most frequently seen in ALS. So CML patients with E1, A2 transcript may have a worse prognosis than those with the typical B210 BC. This is a publication from Burma et al. in blood in 2009. So somebody may ask what is the importance of knowing what the transcript type is. There are two reasons. One is that you just saw that it could have some prognostic significance. The other is when you are trying to monitor the copy numbers, after you have treated them with TKIs, it is important to know what type of transcript are you trying to quantify. So other than these uh, three common transcripts, what is most important is that uh, these circles, what you are seeing, this are the, this is the, these are the able kinase domain, which is common to all transcripts. So this is the domain that we are going to target when we are looking for the able kinase domain mutation when we subsequently discuss that. So in addition to the three commonly occurring transcripts, you can have variant transcripts either in the form of E19A2, which is the micro VCR or P230, which is uh, the third most frequently occurring chronic myeloid leukemia transcript. In addition to that, you can have E6A2, you can have E8A2, and you can have many, you have, can have abnormality in exon A3. So there are large number of aberrant transcripts that also can be seen, but when you are designing the primers, normally they are not designed to detect these. So if you have a strong clinical suspicion of chronic myeloid leukemia and your fish is positive, but RT-PCR is negative for the fact that your primers are not designed to detect these transcripts. So you must do either NGS or fungus sequencing by a separate set of primers for the detection of these variant transcripts. So the, uh, the, the workflow will be uh, the BCR able fusion transcripts will be seen by fish, but your RT-PCR is negative. So then you should be suspicious that probably you have, you are dealing with a variant transcript. So this is a slide which I have borrowed from a friend of mine in Hammersmith Hospital. His name is Dr. Jaspal Kida. I think Nihar may be knowing him. Jaspal used to work in the MRC Adult Leukemia Research Lab at the Hammersmith Hospital uh, with Professor John Goldman and uh, Junior Mello and uh, a few others. So this is something called limiting dilution assay. So this was the first methodology which was evolved when uh, the uh, hydroxyurea, when the interferons in the, uh, in the different iris study they were trying to quantify. So limiting dilution assay was the first technique that got evolved to quantify the transcripts. And Jaspal Kira was very much involved in this assay design. And this is how they used to dilute it serially. This is used to be a humongous task for the serial dilution and then doing gel documentation to see at what dilution the bands are disappearing. So it used to be a task which is almost a week's job to uh, do this assay for a couple of patients. So this got uh, uh, changed to the real-time PCR after the real-time platforms got uh, into the commercial market. So uh, quantification of uh, the pcr transcripts is extremely important for the this, uh, detection as well as monitoring. Sometimes you detect as well as quantify our diagnosis the current guideline is that NCCM guideline says that you should detect it as well as quantify it even a diagnosis. So quantitative PCR determines the amount of the disease that is present at any given point of time. So what happens here, you do the RNA extraction, you do the RT-PCR, 
PCR cycling, fluorescence detection, and the result calculation in a real-time PCR platform. Here, the addition of a fluorescent probe to the PCR reaction mix, an analysis on a specific instrument that is called the real-time PCR machine, allows this quantification to happen uh, rather than the quantitative assay that we do on the gel blocks. So this is a screenshot of the real-time PCR. You can find that this, these are the curves and this will depend on at what quantity the uh, targets are. So more the target earlier, it will show up or lesser the target, it will go quite late. And this, these are the samples. Every sample is put in duplicates or replicates or even sometimes in triplicates for quality control purposes because majority of our assays are manual based. We do manual pipetting, so it is probable that sometimes you may miss out on a well or you may put the sample twice in a well or no sample in a well. So because of that, always replicate testing and triplicate testing is advisable in real-time PCR until and unless your laboratory has liquid handling platforms. So liquid handling platforms will take away the monotonous nature of pipetting into every well that you do in a molecular lab. So this is a very familiar site on a real time screen. This is the standard curve here in BCRable quantification. You have a standard curve for BCR, BCR or ABLE, and you have a standard curve for BCR ABLE. So mostly they are parallel and you have different concentrations of the product which are commercially available or you can do uh, it in your own lab by baking your plasmid standards. When it started, every lab used to make their own plasmid standards but like it is commercially available, we buy them. Like in our lab also, we used to take it slow. They were kind enough to give us the standards for our BCRable asset. But now we buy them all the cell from the commercial market and use them. So this is how it looks like because based on the standard uh, curve, your results will uh, depend on a good standard curve will give good result. If all the points are on a single line, that means the standard curve is very good, but at least there are some uh, quality control guidelines which I will not go into the details to save time. So the next thing comes is standardization of the BCR. The pediatric hematologists are not so much confronted with these issues on a day-to-day -day basis, but adult hematologists are confronted with because they treat more CMLs than the pediatric hematologists. But I think whatever patients you treat in the pediatric setting, it is also important to know what this standardization is all about. So standardization is on the international scale. It is called just like when you have prothrombin time and you convert them into INR through an ISI. So that is for standardization of prothrombin time across the continents, across laboratories, across countries. So wherever the patient moves with a particular anticoagulant, the INR will remain the same. Even though the reagents change, the platform change, the labs change. Similarly, the, uh, the international CML study group is trying, is, has evolved as international scale reporting. Labs like uh, Hammersmith Hospital, the Andrea Hawkes' lab in Germany, uh, Team Hughes' lab in Royal Adelaide in Australia. So there are about seven, eight laboratories which are the international centers of excellence in this area. They have devised this BCR able uh, re international reporting scale because they want to align all the results to a uniform standard. So consistency of interpretation is desirable. So the limit of variation should be minimized between methods and platforms. And this will enable everyone to compare the response rates across different clinical trials, which is very, very important. And this will also enable patients to move from one place to the other without getting concerned about the result of their bcr able assays. So I'll just show you a cartoonized uh, graph of the international reporting scale. You can see that 
this is the point at which you call it as C log reduction or the major molecular response. So at, at um, 12 months, it is expected that the patient will reach, uh, will reach the milestone of major molecular response. So this is the line. And uh, if you see that this is anything which is lower than 0.10% uh, is major molecular response. So I will, so these are the time points at which a patient has been uh, checked for the desirable transcripts and you have so much of variation. Some points are above the red line, some points are below the red line. So what do you do with this? This has happened because of the international scale reporting because you have a conversion factor. So every kit that you use now commercially available has a conversion factor, just like you have a international sensitivity index in a prothrombin time reagent kit. Similarly, every kit commercially available has got a conversion factor written in the kit. So whatever BCR able to able ratio that you get in your laboratory, you have to multiply it with the conversion factor. So all those disparted results that you saw in the previous slide has aligned itself to the three log reduction label of 0.1%. So that's the principle of international scale reporting. And now every laboratory, which is a good molecular lab, should align themselves to the international scale reporting. And we are aligned to this IS scale of reporting in our lab. So Whatever techniques you use, whatever platform you use, whatever kits you use, it is extremely difficult for achieving 100% concordance of MMR and it is not achievable. So every assay will have variations. However, the degree of variation has to be minimized and the degree of variation will affect the concordance of major molecular reaction. You can have variations. That is why the accreditation bodies, if you accredited this particular test through NABL. The coefficient of variation acceptable is up to 25%. Whereas if you take hemoglobin, the coefficient of variation is 0.1%. So even 25% variation is acceptable for this assay. So much is the variation. The international bodies have gone to the extent of accepting 25% variation in BCR able transcript level. That is why whenever you have a patient and where you find that the BCR able transcripts have gone up, you don't react immediately. It is not actionable in the first report. So you will always wait, continue with the same treatment, repeat it after a month or two months or three months, depending on your institutional protocol. And if there is a significant change or there is concordance in the report, in subsequent uh, repetition of the test, then only you make changes to the therapy. Otherwise, just an isolated report showing increase in the in the I scale of BCR able, you don't react. So this is a very familiar slide, which is the measurable residual disease as part of the treatment protocol in chronic myeloid leukemia. You, you know that when you have a diagnosis, you have 10 to the power 12 cells. And by the time you are in detectable limit or you have the measurable detection, that goes up to 10 to the power minus six. So you have leukocytosis, you have Philadelphia chromosome positivity, you have RQPCR, which, is, which has gone down by three loss, and you have RQPCRs, which are negative, and you have undetectable transcripts. You will reach a stage where it is undetectable transcript because now we have a concept of treatment free remission. Because if you want to select certain patients who can be included in the TFR trial, your laboratory has to be in IS, at least IS 4.5 scale. 4.5 means you should be able to detect 4.5 log reduction in the BCR will transcript. Even 4.0 on do because you have to be consistently at 4.5 at least for two years 
to be included in the TFR trials. Otherwise, you cannot be included in the trial. So your laboratory has to be very, very precise in giving out reports. And 4.5 means your detection of the housekeeping gene has to be so precise that you should be able to detect uh, at least 32,000 copies of the ABUL or BCR copy. BCR is a housekeeping gene, ABUL is a housekeeping gene. In our lab, we use the housekeeping gene as ABUL. Some laboratory use BCR also. Some uses GAP uh, D8 also. So there are different laboratories use different housekeeping genes. Some uses beta actin also. But majority of the centers use either BCR or ABUL. So, uh, so what is the importance of these figures? So when you treat a patient of chronic myeloid leukemia, you have baseline data. You have so-called scoring, what Nihara has already told. You have UTOS, you have uh, HASCO. There are many, many types of uh, prognostic scoring uh, systems. But when you treat the patients with TKI, before that it was with interferon or transplant, you monitor them every three monthly and there are time points or there are alerts which should alert you whether the treatment is going on fine, the patient is responding well. So currently, I will show you the ELN 2020 guideline in the next slide. You will find that at three months, the patient should have a BCR equal high scale of less than 10%. At six months, it should be less than 1%. And 12 months, the patient should go into major molecular remission. That is point less than equal to 0.1%. So there are certain warning uh, signs and there are some failures. If it is warning sign, then you change treatment. Either you increase the dose. In adults, they increase from 400 milligram OD to 600 to 800. 800 is the maximum. Similarly, in pediatrics also, you do dose changes. So failure is when your CHR goes, CHR means complete hematologic response, or if you're doing by Philadelphia chromosome, by conventional karyotyping, your Philadelphia chromosomes increase in number. Normally, when you do conventional karyotyping, you look for 20 metaphages. And out of 20, if you find that 19 or 18 are showing Philadelphia uh, chromosome, that means the disease is back. So the treatment has failed. So these are the ways by which you can monitor the response. ELN is European Leukemia Net Response Definitions for any of the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, right from imatinib to desatinib to nilotinib, conatinib, bosotinib, or any tinibs that we talk about. So these are the warning signs which are not going to return. Some are warning, some are failures, and when it is Warning, more frequent monitoring is required. Dose increases to be considered. When it is failure, you have to look for the bcr kinase domain mutation analysis. We'll come to that in a slide. Or you have to look for cytogenetics. That is why I say conventional cytogenetics is here to stay because if you want to document clonal evolution, you have to do conventional karyotyping. Because in addition to 922, you will get additional chromosomal evolution abnormalities along with it. So this is the ELN 2020 recommendation for molecular monitoring and addressing the rising bcr labels. This was published in 2020. Andrea Hogel is the first author, but it is, a, it is a European group that has published it. And Andrea Hockel is from Germany. So here you find that you, when you treat patients of CML, you monitor them at three, six, and 12 months. And there are certain criteria where you call it optimal response, warning response, and treatment failure. I will not go into the details. I've already mentioned about these figures. So monitor if it is optimally responding every three to six months. We, in our center, do it every three months. Some centers do it at six months. Warning response, if it is there, then you monitor it more frequently, preferably monthly. And when you have treatment failure, you consider the mutational analysis and switch the treatment from one TKI to the other after doing the mutation analysis. So a change of treatment will only be considered if more major molecular remission hasn't been achieved by 36 to 48 months. Ideally, it should be reached in 12 months, but you normally continue treatment as per ELN guideline up to three years before you consider 
uh, switching over to another TKI. So I mentioned about cytogenetic evolution. I said that CML is a disease which is characterized by 922 as a sole abnormality, which is present throughout the CML CT phase. CT is chronic phase. But as the disease progresses, when you progress to CML accelerated phase or CML phase of last crisis or DC, 60 to 80 percent of such patients will develop additional chromosomal abnormality. You will not be able to detect this until unless you are doing conventional therapy. So the cytogenetics genetics department will never be redundant. It will continue to be there, and this, they are the ones who will be detecting these additional chromosomal abnormalities. So, uh, very uh, early publication by Mittelman has said that an extra Philadelphia chromosome, trisomy 8, isochromosome 17q are some of the common additional or uh, uh, chromosomal abnormalities that are found as secondary changes in chronic myeloid leukemia. Sometimes you will find reports where somebody has reported BCA able to able ratio of 250%. That is possible. Don't get alarmed by it because if there are multiple copies of Philadelphia chromosome, inside a uh, cell, single nuclei. So you will have one housekeeping gene that's able, but you have multiple BCR-able copies. So BCR-able copies will be more, the housekeeping copies will be less. So it is possible that you may have more than 100% BCR-able people ratio also in certain patients. So this is a four-year-old patient on imatinib, not in complete hematologic response, immediately after six months of starting imatinib. You can find that you have the 922 there already uh, under the red circle, but you have developed another abnormality that is inversion 16. So this patient has got inversion 16 in addition to the Philadelphia chromosome. So what do you get? So you have this type of a marrow where you find eosinophilic precursor is increasing. You have these are the basophilic myelocytes and also you have eosinophilic myelocytes. So this is a CML which is evolving to acute myeloid leukemia M4 with eosinophilia as per the old FAR classification system where you have inversion 16 in addition to 922 which is nothing but a core binding factor leukemia. So this is CML which is evolved into acute myeloid leukemia in blast crisis. So what happens? Why does this happen? So there are two ways how resistance develops to imatinib in CMLs. One is the BCA-able independent mechanism, another one is the BCA-able dependent mechanism. Many times we do the BCA-able kinase domain mutation, but we don't find the mutation to be there. So if you see statistically in a meta-analysis, it will seem that BCA-able kinase domain mutations are seen only in about 35 to 60% of the patients. Whereas in the other 40 to 65% uh, of the patients, you have a BCA-able independent mechanism. That is one. The other than that is the sensitivity of this assay. If you do Sanger sequencing, the sensitivity is 15 to 20%. Whereas the next generation sequencing assays are 3 to 5%, even 1 to 3% with highly uh, refined uh, NGSs. So the entire European continent is shifting over, I'll come to that later, from the Sanger sequencing platform to the NGSs for BCA-able kinase domain mutation analysis. So I'll just touch upon what is the BCA-able independent mechanism here. You have the issue of pharmacokinetics and the oral bioavailability of the drug. So you all know that you have cytochrome 450 in your liver, which is nothing but an enzyme which is responsible for the metabolism of the drugs that passes through the liver. So if this enzyme is hyperactive or this enzyme is not so active, so the pharmacokinetics of the drug will change. If this clears the imatinib mesylate very early and rapidly, your bioavailability will be less. 
So activation of alternate signaling pathways like SAR kinase pathways, if they're overexpressed, you also have an alternate kinase pathway moving alongside when you have suppressed the standard TKI, Harrison kinase pathway, but the SAR kinase pathway is active. So there will be uh, proliferation of the myeloid cells. Clonal evolution, I have already described. In addition to 922, you have many other chromosomes that can be seen, translocations, the, the, uh, the structural abnormalities that are seen. SNP in drug transporters, single nucleotide polymorphism, particularly the uh, OCT1 gene, which is overexpressed. So here what happens, the influx and the efflux of the drug into the cell becomes defective. If it is overexpressed, it effluxes very rapidly because the imatinib mesonate will not stay inside the cell for longer if this is overexpressed. So single nucleotide polymorphism in this gene can be looked for. And the next thing, the visible kinase domain, which we'll discuss. In addition to that, you can have overexpression, uh, duplication and amplification of the visible, which I have already mentioned. That is the reason why you may have more than 100% visible people this way. So this is what happens. You have a proliferating nucleic stem cells, and you have this kinase domain where a mutation has happened in the form of a blinking red signal. So what will happen when you give imatinib? The imatinib will not go and bind at the imatinib binding site. So there will be no imatinib. As a result of that, the substrate will go and bind there. Substrate phosphorylation, reactivation of the signal transduction system cascade. And as a result, the disease will be bad. So this is a imatinib resistant flaw. So here, some mutation has happened in the kinase domain, uh, in the visceral kinase domain. So the strategy that we use, we use the direct sequencing strategy by using the Sanger sequence. You have the normal label allele here, you have the visceral allele where you have this the kinase domain. As I mentioned, kinase domain in all types of transcripts are the same. So here we uh, develop a primer set Royal Adelaide uses, this is a slide actually from Suzanne Branford from Royal Adelaide and thank her for that. So this is a long PCR, long range, range PCR, where you are looking for anything around 1500 base pairs. So the electrophoresis occurs overnight for six hours. Before they leave the lab, they will put it up and then they will come back the next day morning and the electrophoresis will be complete. We don't do this. We divide it into three sets of primers. So our segments are sorted. And then we merge them to analyze if there are these things. So our run times are about one and a half to two hours, not more than that. So uh, this is nothing but a semi-nested PCR, which is about 860 base pairs. Uh, that is the... Uh, in brief, the diagnosis and the monitoring of patients with chronic myeloid leukemia. And I, I will fail in my duty if I don't pay my gratitude to this man with whom I worked for one month at the MRC Adult Leukemia Research Lab way back in 1999. So it was almost 22 years ago, he was young and this is his office. You can see all these are uh, CML files and folders. And when I went to his room, and that was my last day in the department. So I called uh, his PA, who was a lady sitting outside in the small room to connect with a picture with the professor. He said, have you taken permission of the professor? So this conversation, he was listening to from inside. He said, no, 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 send in the Indian doctor. So I went inside and this picture has been clicked by his uh, PA. And uh, I treasure this picture and he is no more today. Nihar has already paid his own gratitude and I pay my gratitude to Professor John Goldman, who is a client of chronic myeloid leukemia in the entire world. So everything is possible only when you work in team. And this is a large team in Tata Medical Center. You have a big laboratory team, you have 
adult clinical hematology, you have pediatric hematology. So all these people are contributing to what I have presented today. And I thank all of them. So thank you very much. Hope I haven't uh, overshot my time. You have. Uh, thank you. I, I hope uh, no. people are listening. I think we'll proceed with the cases. Yes. My apologies if I have uh, crossed the time limit. Yeah. So I hand over it right back to the organizers, I think. Yes, we're waiting for them to start. So we will we will just start now. We are just uh, thanks. Thank you very much, Dr. Mishra. Uh, we are going to start the case studies. Uh, I'm just trying to share the screen. Uh, this is Shekhar Krishnan here. Yes, sir. Oh, sorry, apology. Butterfingers. Add this in a moment. Just give me a moment. Give us a moment. Is this? I hope this is visible. Yes, sir. So, could you make it full screen though? Okay, we will do that. Thanks. Okay, right. Hang on. Just give us a moment. It's uh, it's taking some time. Just go, just give us a moment. The screen is just hung. That's a moment. Yeah. I'm just going to minimize and and then share and then uh, re reboot it. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Sir. Yeah. Stop share. Just I'm just going to stop share for a while. Yeah. I'm going to open this. Just give us a moment, sorry, just give us a moment. Yes, sir. If you have it on your mail, you could mail it to one of us. Yeah, we will do that. Just, uh, it's just decide to have a mind of its own. So to avoid any embarrassing conversation, I'm going to mute. We can see it, sir. Okay, and now. Okay. Yes. Okay, now, sorry about the technical glitch. So we are going to introduce uh, uh, two, uh, two of our colleagues. This is uh, Dr. Deepankar Dey, who is a fellow in pediatric hematology oncology at uh, in, in our department at Tara Medical Center. Uh, these format will be uh, case presentations, short stems, uh, some data, and then followed by discussion of the key questions of the case uh, throws up. Awesome. Yes. 
start. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. So, first case this is an adolescent old girl who came with the background history of pain in the right leg for one month with intermittent fever. Uh, on evaluation, uh, she had Mesis pneumogaly without any extramedullary disease. Uh, with about two lakhs of WBC counts, with one lakh twenty-eight thousands of platelet, with three percent basophils and one percent blast in the peripheral smear, and when we have done the bone marrow, bone marrow showed three percent blast and two percent promyelocyte with hypercellular bone marrow with marked myeloid hyperplasia, and the fish for BCR ABL came positive. So according to criteria, the child uh, was diagnosed with CML with chronic phase. So after that, we have started the first generation uh, TKI with imatinib. So after imatinib, we have monitored the BCR ABL uh, task with issue. Uh, and she had achieved the major molecular response at 18 months. And following which, she maintained the major molecular response for next two consecutive years. So now, uh, whether we can stop this imatinib. So I'm handing over to my consultant. So thank you very much. Uh, before we go through the cases, I will just like to, uh, in the interest of time, just very quickly say that we have chosen this format in order to, uh, this, uh, this cases are pitched for the, uh, for, uh, for the fellows who are in training and people, people in early in their career. And what we have tried to show is how we, we want to analyze the data. And we're looking particularly at blasts in the, in the blood. And we are combining blasts in the bone marrow as a, as a quantity. And we then we're looking at fixed criteria which allows us to categorize the patients into chronic phase, accelerated phase, or blast phase. And this patient, as you can see, uh, fulfills the criteria for chronic phase disease. This is the NCCN uh, traffic light system for molecular monitoring. It's uh, slightly different and we'll come to this point later. And you can see that this patient has achieved a major molecular response uh, timely manner and sustains it uh, at, uh, at uh, 42 months into treatment. The questions then that uh, we are confronted with with is whether this is an indication for us to stop imatinib in these patients. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll be very quick. So the issue here is previously the paradigm used to be lifelong uh, TKI therapy, but now as uh, Dr. Mishra had mentioned, uh, there is now the opportunity for us considering uh, top, stopping uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors in patients with deep molecular response. A proportion of these patients relapse and then they need to resume therapy. And there are some patients who sustain a remission, uh, operational remission after stopping TKI. Now, this is, a, this, this is a very complicated slide. The reason this slide has been put in is to let uh, uh, people in training know how the different ways of representing data. This is what's called a bubble plot. The size of the bubble represents the number of patients in each study. These are various studies. Uh, on the x-axis, you can see the duration of uh, TKI treatment prior to treatment-free remission and the treatment-free remission rates are in the y-axis. And what you can see here from this graph is that about mo most of the studies are looking at about seven and a half years of uh, TKI duration prior to initiating uh, treatment-free remission uh, trials. And roughly about 50% of patients sustain this remission uh, after discontinuation of TKI. That's the adult data. Now in, uh, in pediatrics, as uh, Dr. Nihar had mentioned, there is also an additional consideration of trying to interrupt imatinib treatment to allow uh, growth and puberty to develop, and we'll come to that in the next slides, and also in the older uh, patients' uh, pregnancy planning as well. Now, unlike an adult this, uh, series, pediatrics, we have a very limited number of information, and also because it's a rare disease. So this is a, a multi-country multi initiative from the uh, International CML Registry, from the IBFM study group. And what you can see here is that uh, this is a, looking at the pro probability of maintaining deep molecular remission after discontinuing uh, treatment. If you look on the, on, the, on the right upper panel, what you can see is these are older patients who have had treatment for roughly five and a half years. And the proportion actually sustaining response is 28%, four of 14 compared to the 50% in adults, suggesting that in children, perhaps the, this particular interval proportion is lower but these are of course small numbers, again, indicating the unique biology of the disease. And that's reflected in this particular slide showing that the uh, probability of maintaining treatment-free remission is the interplay of three factors, the biology of the disease, the duration of treatment, and the immune reconstitution of the host in order to keep the disease at bay. Now, this is a, a last slide for this particular case. And the point being made, and this is uh, 
quite uh, a lot of uh, body of work from PGI MER Chandigarh, and I want to acknowledge uh, Dr. Deepa Bansal's work and colleagues, showing that this kind of studies can also be done in our circumstances. And the point being made here, and this is, uh, if you look at, there are three bits of information here. To, uh, if, you have, if I draw your attention to the left side, you will see box whisker plots, which show that with the imatinib duration, the height standard deviation score falls below what is, uh, what is, uh, what is standard for that particular age. And if you look in the right upper panel, you can see that that's because of uh, many of these patients have delayed bone age, uh, either growth hormone deficiency or, or an insensitivity to growth hormone effective or uh, activity, suggesting that this is one of the key disruptors for growth. And that uh, highlights a point that uh, endocrine disruption is an important uh, consideration in adult, in uh, children, especially growth and puberty disorders and disorders of thyroid function. And this may be another consideration for trial of uh, TKI interruption. I think I've, this case is, is completed. Hold your questions and the chat boxes, we will go to the next case. Dr. Deepankar. Yes. So next case is a very young child, four years uh, old who came uh, with the background history of gradual, uh, gradual onset of abdominal distensions with history of intermittent fever for two to three weeks. Uh, he also uh, had massive spandomegaly without any extramedullary disease with very high WBC count with three lakhs 39,000 of platelet counts with 2% uh, basophils and 4% uh, blast. And um, fish for BCR APL uh, also came positive and uh, uh, peripheral blast of my myelopolyparative neoplasms. So uh, according to this criteria, this child also uh, was diagnosed as a case of CML with chronic phase. So uh, we have started with uh, first generation TKI. Uh, although uh, at the three months, child had a yellow zone, but uh, in the six months, um, child was in uh, green zone. So uh, about the side effects of this. So, uh, uh, yes, yeah, sorry, sir, Dr. Deepankar suddenly had an attack of uh, nerves, I think. So the, there, there are troublesome skeletal pain and muscular cramps. This is one, one element which has uh, made it difficult to administer this particular, uh, particular uh, drug to uh, this patient. And the question then is CML and imatinibility side effect, uh, one of our banes of management of uh, CML, uh, how do we manage this condition? Now, uh, this is something that Dr. Nihar actually uh, highlighted, and th this is something we want to draw to attention of uh, people listening in, that the categorization of the, of the response actually de depends on which uh, traffic light system you are following. So on the upper, upper panel is the, uh, from the United States, the National uh, Cancer, uh, cancer uh, National Cancer Center, sorry, apology. And below this is from the British uh, Committee uh, uh, from the Society of Hematology. And you can see that the, that, the, that the zones are different. And this is something that Prof. Mishra had pointed out and Nihar had also highlighted that at six months, the expectation is to have a response of 1%. Uh, and in this case, if you see that uh, in the BCH guidelines, this will be a yellow uh, alert. Whereas in the NCCN guidelines from the North, North American group, this is will be considered still within uh, as acceptable. So just, just to, just for, so for institutional practice, we should have one criterion and stick to it. And that's the message of this particular slide. Now, the message of this particular slide is to focus on the fact that with imaginative treatment, there are two points which are significant in terms of trying to discontinue treatment, forcing us physicians to discontinue treatment, mainly myelosuppression and that's neutropenia. And this seems to occur very early in treatment. It occurs for perhaps when we transi transition from hydroxyurea to imatinib at that point in time, and perhaps in the first three months, sometimes with viral infections, anemia and thrombocytopenia also can be troublesome. So myelosuppression is one important point when we talked about musculoskeletal problems and uh, growth deceleration in patients. So these are the major toxicities which cause us to interrupt treatment. But what is less, uh, what is um, often some perhaps not well, well, not well highlighted in adult literature, but uh, certainly a problem that we see very commonly in pediatrics is, is the, uh, with imatinib, we have two major problems. One is gastrointestinal toxicities, nausea, vomiting, abdominal cramps, and diarrhea in, in diarrhea in patients, which sometimes, which forces them to be non-adherent to treatment, muscle cramps and bone pain. Uh, this is uh, another, joint pains. This is another problem which uh, disrupts um, quality of life and adherence to treatment. Uh, one interesting thing that uh, many of us have seen is that uh, the uh, darker skinned uh, population of ours often see uh, lighter, lighter pigmentation of skin. Uh, it may or may not be a welcome side effect. 
the uh, the uh, fatigue is something that is also highlighted by patients, especially the older patients, and maybe related to anemia and also perhaps thyroid disorder. And the important point here is that the quality disruption uh, caused by these TKIs can in actually interfere with adherence. The point in this particular slide is that we are now fortunate in a, in a, in a position where we now have greater access, uh, affordable access to, uh, to alternative TKIs beyond uh, imatinib. And we can therefore use this bubble graph to try and choose uh, alternative agents in patients who have intolerance problems, for instance, imatinib, uh, you know, for instance, you can, uh, patients with uh, GI side effects, uh, desatinib is an option and so on. And this is also highlighted in this particular um, slightly pixelated uh, table, which gives a heat map profile of the various, for instance, if you can see here, imatinib, GI side effects and uh, problematic, and they are less common in desatinib, slightly also seen in nilotinib and so on and so forth. Myelosuppression probably more a problem in, uh, in desatinib and less in imatinib and so on. So I think those are the points here. And I think I hand over now to uh, case number three, to Dipankar again. So case number three, here a nine years old guy who came with the background history of pain in the leg and arm uh, with intermittent fever, open wound. On evaluations, uh, she had Messi's megaly without any extramedullary disease with 59,000 of uh, WAC count with 4 lakh 19,000 of platelet with 3% vesophis, 15% blast in the peripheral span. And we have done the bone marrow. Bone marrow contains 70% uh, blast. Uh, and fish for BCR APL, it also came positive. So according to the guideline, child was diagnosed with CML with uh, isolated face. So uh, we have started with the treatments uh, with the third generation TKI that is imatinix. So at the three months, uh, BCR ABL transcript of 14.4 persons and six months we could not do because of the uh, COVID pandemic situations. At 12 months also, 3.05, that is both three and 12 months, uh, the child is in the uh, zone. So that times we have converted the TKI, uh, first generation to second generation, that is imatinix to desatinix. And also we have done the, uh, at, um, HLA typing for uh, five siblings, uh, but none of the sibling has been matched. And 15 months, again, we have evaluated BCR ABL transcript level. It was 1.4, uh, that is in the child is in the uh, red zone. And today, child came in the OPD. So we have sent for uh, uh, TKD mutation analysis. So uh, about the, uh, when the child presented in the AP case about the management of the uh, case. So it's more of uh, here we'll consider it on a CML, uh, a child presenting um, in the advanced phase or accelerated phase uh, at first presentation. Um, uh, no, just, just, just skip, just say skip, just say skip. And go back to the slide view, it'll come up. Uh, here making uh, a similar point that particularly with the advanced phase as well, different criteria, the different uh, institutions have used different criteria starting from 10 to 29%. So the cutoffs are very different. So with a 10% cutoff or 15% cutoff to start off with and to call it a, a blast crisis, whether it's a 20% or the 30%. So people need to be very careful. It's very difficult to, um, uh, to take one study with the other and confuse ourselves. But most people nowadays possibly will follow the ELN uh, guidelines. So again, making that point around 17% blast, where do we stand? But uh, uh, in terms of advanced uh, phase disease at diagnosis, the uh, initial presentation, uh, initial management is fairly similar. Star TKI, it's a, preferably a second generation TKI, which we did not have an access to because at that point, uh, we did not have direct access to either nivolumab or the satellite. Now, depending on whether they get into a good response, you can continue. If they do not, then obviously the transplant uh, has to be considered. But here, the important uh, difference that we have uh, rather has been uh, seen, uh, the difference between adults and uh, children uh, presenting in advanced phases at de novo at, at presentation is that actually they are not as bad. So the de novo um, uh, accelerated phase in children are not as bad. So the uh, overall survival is more than 90% if they're managed well and if they respond.
So next is a thirteen year old boy who presented with history of progressive abdominal distension and intermittent fever uh, of three weeks duration, and on examination found to have uh, hepatosplenomegaly, and uh, 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 on per hemogram showed uh, total counts of four lakhs. And platelets of 12 lakhs with the uh, basophils 1% and the uh, blasts are 1% in peripheral blood and uh, promyelocytes are 1%. So, uh, based on the clinical presentation, uh, tonic uh, myeloid leukemia is suspected and fish for, uh, fish for BCR ABL was sent, which was positive. So, based on this uh, criteria, uh, he was. Uh, diagnosed as a, a CML chronic phase initially, and then he was started on im imatinib. Uh, however, after two months after treatment, uh, he has defaulted treatment. And 16 months later, uh, he presented with increasing pallor, abdominal distension, and found to have massive hepatosplenomegaly with a total counts of 2.8 lakhs, platelets of 6.5 lakhs, and uh, blasts of 5%. Uh, so again, uh, here imatinib was started, and uh, he had good response till uh, uh, two years. Uh, and uh, but at 30, uh, 30 months, we found that uh, uh, RQPCR is increasing. So at this point, we have increased the dose of imatinib, uh, but he uh, had uh, side effects like uh, vomiting and skeletal pains. And also, uh, the subsequent RQPCR showed increase in the uh, transcript ratio. So at this point, uh, mutational analysis was uh, sent, uh, which is positive for G250E, uh, which I will show you in the subsequent slide. And here, uh, nilotinib has been started. Uh, and at that time, dasatinib is not uh, available. And uh, even even on nilotinib, uh, he uh, progressed uh, clinically and also in terms of uh, increasing uh, WBC counts and low hemoglobin of uh, 8.9. Uh, and uh, here we have uh, switched to uh, dasatinib. Uh, we have. Uh, uh, we have uh, suggested uh, for hepatopoietic stem cell transplantation, but uh, due to limited resources, uh, it could not be done. So coming to the quantitative PCR response, at uh, three months, we are in yellow zone, uh, and at six months, we are in red zone, though here at that time, we don't have options for uh, second generation TKI, so uh, we have just increased the dose. So as we can see here, uh, after 12 months, the child has uh, fell in red zone. So the course of treatment, uh, initially he presented as a chronic phase, but uh, due to presence of uh, increasing WBC counts and splenomegaly, he has uh, progressed to uh, AP. So uh, this is the mutation I want to show you. Uh, this shows this slide shows the mutations of tyrosine kinase and the sensitivity of the mutations to each uh, drugs. So as we can see, this patient has G250E mutation, which is sensitive to both nilotinib and dasatinib. So now we want to discuss uh, how to approach a patient with suboptimal treatment response. So with the uh, CML with sub, uh, so with this child definitely uh, uh, somebody who had progressed from chronic phase, which is different from somebody who had presented in an advanced phase. Here uh, we would have considered clonal evaluation, and we had done the BCR ABL uh, kinase mutation, um, which identified uh, a particular mutation which should have been sensitive to uh, both nilotinib and dasatinib, but it did not respond very well to nilotinib, and there is some success with dasatinib and should have gone for transplant which we can uh, offer to this child because of the resource limitation. Now, uh, one of the uh, problems, whenever we talk about the TKI failure or resistance, they are changed interchangeably, but they are, they are used interchangeably, but they are not. So the TKI, uh, it's seen that almost uh, for in long-term use, once you start off with a, uh, say, imatinib, almost 40, 50% patients would need to go on to second-generation TKI, and that might not work. 
and possibly another 20% each would ultimately 20% would require to go on to uh, say a dasatinib or uh, uh, some of them will need to go on to ponatinib depending on the P315I uh, mutation. Now, uh, the reason why this happens particularly are both dependent on PCR, uh, ABL dependent resistance uh, pathways, which uh, Professor Mishra has already described. But one of the uh, other pathways is the PCR ABL independent resistance pathways, which are different, which you will not be uh, able to pick up by doing the TKD mutations. Now, in terms of the dynamics of the mutation, then uh, the thought that was considered, as Shekhar has described, that we considered a uh, treatment free response. But some of them we can relapse and then come back again. But if you have, uh, if you develop a BCR ABL uh, independent genetic hit, then it, the clonal evolution can continue and it can uh, become a, a recurrent uh, problem. Now, some of these mutations possibly happen at the same time as uh, uh, while the patient is on therapy, some of them possibly happen even before therapy and can ultimately lead on to the problem. The bigger problem is when uh, uh, the, there is a difference in the polyclonal mutation and compound mutations. Compound mutations means in the same BCR transcript in the kinase, you have got the, in the kinase domain, you have got two mutations, which are more difficult to treat uh, possibly than the ones where you have two different clones containing two different uh, mutations. So keeping all these facts, it becomes quite difficult, particularly when you are using sequential uh, TKIs, because after the point, they seem to acquire more and more uh, mutations and ultimately you are not left with anything else other than uh, the either the experimental therapy or HSAT. So I'll hand over to the, to the fifth case. This is a 12-year-old uh, boy who presented with uh, intermittent uh, fever of one month duration, but on examination, uh, there is no organomegaly or any extramedullary disease. And uh, uh, hemogram showed uh, total counts of 69,000 and platelets of 3.5 lakhs and 2% glass uh, in the uh, peripheral smear. So bone marrow was done, uh, which showed 2% uh, glass and uh, suggestive of myeloproliferative neoplasm and uh, fish for BCR ABL is uh, positive. So a diagnosis of uh, CML uh, CP is made uh, based on this criteria and he was started on imatinib. So um, initially, he the child has attained a complete cytogenetic response at 12 months, but later he is found to have increasing RQPCR ratio. So where uh, we have done mutation testing, but we could not find any mutation, and uh, imatinib dose has been increased, uh, but still uh, the child has progressed uh, clinically with uh, uh, CNS disease and also mediastinal mass and development of uh, myeloid uh, uh, blast crisis with the total counts of 1.6 lakhs and hemoglobin as low as seven, uh, but platelets are 1.5 lakhs, but blasts of 14% in the peripheral smear. So here we have uh, uh, started him on the satin and uh, combination interferon uh, chemotherapy and the uh, plan for uh, transplant has been made, but he progressed uh, quickly uh, and uh, with persistent circulating glass in uh, blood and leading to death. So here, uh, though at three months we are in yellow zone uh, and uh, uh, reached green zone in, by, by six months and persisted till uh, 12 months, but after 12 months, uh, he's in red zone. So, uh, in, though he has presented as a CML chronic phase uh, uh, due to the presence of extramedullary uh, disease and uh, uh, progression of the disease, he has uh, been, uh, he's uh, now a CML with blastresis. So, uh, now we'll discuss about how to manage the blast phase of CML. So thank you very much, Dr. Shravya. I think uh, the points here in this particular patient, if I go back to the, uh, to the uh, uh, profile, um, these are important considerations because uh, as uh, uh, one thing is that if you look at the 12-month response and the 18-month response, it looks as if uh, it looks encouraging, complete cytogenetic response was observed. One of the questions we were toying with as clinicians was uh, this boy had, a, had two problems. One is he was struggling with his medicines uh, in terms of muscle cramps. And second is he had a histocompatible older sibling. 
and therefore there was an opportunity to consider transplant. The family was motivated enough to, to go ahead with that plan. So we toyed uh, around and we tried to intensify monitoring to see whether there was any rationale for us to consider this actively. And uh, while we were doing this, uh, uh, this uh, rather explosive blast crisis happened. So there was a window of opportunity which presented itself, but as uh, therapeutically, it was not seized. So it, is a, it has left a scar in my own psyche. And this is something that uh, all of us as physicians will have to sometimes confront. So in this particular patient, if you look, uh, imagine it was the only drug that was available at that time. So a second generation TKI was not available. What we would have done in these days is that we'd have monitored response. If the response had been suboptimal, because if you notice uh, his, uh, his 18 month response was uh, more than 12 month response was, uh, was, was being lost. We'd have switched to a second G, uh, TKI immediately and then considered allo SCT if that response was not observed. But in this particular patient, uh, we, uh, we were considering the idea of a HLA max sibling donor, but the, the blast phase uh, intervened rather explosively and, and there was no opportunity to intervene. Just a point to make about uh, competing decisions about transplant in children, 85% uh, survival, but please remember that there, are also, that, that there can be acute mortality. There is a risk of graft versus host disease, which sometimes can be quite disabling and more uh, worse, and sometimes worse than the disease. And of course, infertility uh, because of your self and condition. Uh, this is something I won't go through this too much, but the, the principle here is that uh, blast crisis in pediatrics typically is lymphoid blast crisis. This is a boy who had a myeloid blast crisis. That's more commonly seen in older patients with CML, uh, advanced CML. The principle here is essentially to um, uh, treat the, the acute leukemia with the appropriate uh, chemotherapy based on the lineage. Um, and also with the TKI, the TKI choice is based also on the mutation profile. And then once remission and some good response is achieved to proceed to transplant. That's the paradigm of management. And the point here is that uh, this is data from the International CML Registry as well, very small numbers. But the point here is that in unlike adult patients, patients with presenting with blast phase, again, a de novo blast phase, CML have, uh, have good response, whether they have transplantation or whether they have TKI load. Uh, with response seeing in about 11 or 13 patients and overall survival being 74, very small numbers, but just telling you that there is, it's a still not a hopeless situation. And now over to, oh, oh yes, uh, last point here is that we had some uh, combination chemotherapy. If you notice, we had given interferon with desatinib. And the point being made here is just to let people know that uh, this interferon is now making a comeback because TKI, uh, they uh, do not target the stem cell component and perhaps are not immune modulating. And therefore there are, there are trials now examining uh, the, uh, TKI combinations with interferon and also other agents which uh, target either the microenvironment. Uh, this is a very exciting agent, Asiminib, which uh, is another way of uh, in, uh, interfering with able kinase function. And of course there, is, uh, the, there are other, some experimental therapies which I will not uh, go to in the interest of time. These are various trials which are available. And that's the reference for this, uh, which I mentioned earlier. Now over to the... Uh, last case. So this is a 14 year uh, old boy who presented with axillary lymphadenopathy and uh, peripheral smear showed 28% uh, blast. Uh, so uh, bone marrow was done which showed 93% uh, uh, blast and flow cytometry uh, is suggestive of B cell precursor ALL and uh, cytogenetics uh, revealed a Philadelphia chromosome uh, positivity uh, and along with uh, dicentric uh, seven and nine chromosome. Uh, so B and fish for BCR ABL is also positive. So he was treated as uh, pH positive ALL and received uh, treatment for high risk ALL for 2.5 years. And uh, at the end of MRD at the end of induction and uh, end of consolidation is uh, less than 0 0.01. And fish for uh, BCR ABL transcript at the end of consolidation is uh, 0 0.04. Uh, but after nine months after completion of uh, treatment for high risk ALL, he presented uh, with neutrophil, uh, neutrophilic leukocytosis without any symptoms. And on examination, uh, he is not having any organomegaly or any extramedullary disease. Uh, and uh, bone marrow studies were done, uh, which showed the hypercellular marrow. Uh, with marked myeloid uh, hyperplasia and which is consistent with myeloproliferative neoplasm and fish for uh, BCR ABL is positive. So uh, now uh, he is uh, CML uh, chronic phase. 
and uh, uh, in the levels of uh, RQPCR monitoring. Uh, he is at a uh, green zone all the way from uh, three months uh, till 18 months. I'll take over here. So, don't mind. so uh, uh, thanks, uh, thanks, Dr. Shafia. Sorry to intrude in the interest of time. So, this is a uh, this is a, uh, a, rare, a rare scenario. It's uh, this is a situation where you have a patient with lymphoid blast or lymph uh, lymphoid. I mean, pH positive ALL, and who has been treated for his uh, for his acute le leukemia. And uh, in the uh, nine months after remission, presents with a second chronic phase. So, so it suggests that actually he had uh, underlying uh, CML, uh, which is uh, which is now a manifest, and that what he presented initially was a blast phase CML, and now uh, the second phase CML, uh, second chronic phase is now returned. And this is this is the uh, unusual situation, because um, when we uh, consulted about management of this particular patient, there was uh, varying uh, uh, opinions from the experts. Now uh, this is a this is a it's not just an academic question. It may also be potentially management issue. And I will just take you through these three points. So if you look in the upper panel, there are uh, there is a question saying how do you distinguish uh, at first presentation of uh, of a Philadelphia acute leukemia whether this is a CML lymphoid blast crisis or pH positive de novo pH positive ALL. There are certain uh, me, uh, certain pointers. But none of these are set in stone. Uh, they can, uh, if you have blood basophils extra, the characteristic cytogenetic abnormalities, or if you see the persistent BCR able fusion in granulocytes after achieving a remission for ALL, perhaps that is probably the strongest finder, the strongest pointer. And this is a this is a, a image from that showing here you can see a typical kidney shaped neutrophil uh, with the fusion here uh, in uh, of the BCR able fusion in addition to the separate discrete B, uh, BCR and ABL signals. And the question really for trying to dissect out is because two, two points, because if it is CML lymphoid blast crisis presenting as pH positive ALL, two points. One is that whether you should consider continuing TKI treatment post uh, completion of ALL treatment and or, and or whether you should recommend transplant in first remission versus patients who present with de novo pH positive ALL. And there is some school of thought saying that therefore it's important to distinguish uh, this, these two entities, de novo pH positive ALL versus underlying uh, CML manifesting for the first time as pH positive ALL. So this is still a matter for debate. In this case, I think provoked, uh, provoked those kind of thoughts. I think we have completed the case series and I now, yeah, I, uh, Dr. Nihar is signaling that I think we have exceeded our time. Um, so I will return this, uh, return the session back to the uh, organized coordinators. Uh, it remains for me to thank uh, Professor Mishra, it, uh, uh, Dr. Neha, and my colleagues, uh, Dr. Shravya and Dr. Deepanka, and also the organizers for the opportunity to share. Thank you, Dr. Shekhar. We have one question in the chat box. Shall I read it out? Yes, please. Yeah, so this is a question from Dr. Suma. Uh, there's a child, three-year-old, newly diagnosed CML, CP with 1.5 lakh WBC count, platelets uh, 13 lakhs at diagnosis, BCR able 37 percentage, all done in Jan, I think this year. And uh, subsequently on treatment, the total count has dropped to 24,000, but platelets will remain the same. Hemoglobin is eight and iron deficiency is also present. So we have optimized imatinib dosage. Is there any, uh, do we need to do any further tests for thrombocytosis? I think from our end, I would think that the biggest elephant in the room is still the CML. Um, uh, so unless proven otherwise, there is CML which has not responded. So um, not responded yet in a sense in, in terms of thrombocytes. I would not go looking for a different cause in this particular child and take this as uh, uh, you know poor response as yet to the TKI. And I think it's too early also, right? So it's it's just... different. You have to give time. That's a different. But I wouldn't go investigating uh, differently. Yes. And I have a question from my side to Dr. Mishra. Sir, when we have uh, different labs reporting uh, CML uh, as BCR, quantitative PCR, what yes. as a clinician, what all should we keep in mind while uh, um, interpreting the report? Now, first of all, if you are getting a report from outside, you must see whether. Uh, the BCR able copy numbers are given, the able copy numbers are given, mm. and then you have the ratio which has been multiplied by the conversion factor. Yes. So that the report is in the highest scale. That is what is to be seen. Mm. And uh, the nitty gritties of how they have tested, you will not be able to know. 
ideally a good lab should be doing the samples and replicate at least. Mm -hmm. So yes. when you decide to send it to a lab, you must know the quality of that lab. Yes. They, they do things as per SOPs and laid down protocols, which is important. Yes, sir. Thank you. So if we don't have any more questions, I would like to thank the team from DMC, Dr. Dibankar Day, Dr. Chituri, Dr. Nehrendu, Dr. Krishnan for their wonderful sessions for the case discussions and uh, Dr. Mishra, sir, for a very good session on the lab diagnosis and monitoring. The, the cases, uh, uh, the very the entire spectrum of cases were discussed from CP to blast crisis and uh, PH positive ALL as well. And the slides were also very good. So thank you from the PHO chapter of IAP. Uh, thank you, everyone.